welcome uh, to our first Macula and Me session of 2024 for the Working Age, working age Focus stream. Um, as you know, we've been doing this for, for a couple of years now since COVID and and we, we've built up a massive library of uh, information around uh, working age conditions uh, and research. We've also had conversations with uh, people dealing with technology um and and well and there's loads to come into 2024 so there's a good calendar so keep an eye out uh for those for those coming along um as always uh this uh, this session um is going to be recorded and, and posted on the macula society website and youtube channel um so you can watch it to your heart's content from there um, we're joined today uh, by my colleague, Sarah Clinton, who's the Patient Information Officer for the Macular Society. So, hi, Sarah, how are you? Hi, I'm good, thanks, how are you? No, not too bad, not too bad. Thanks for joining us today. Um, so, we're going to um, let uh, our speaker uh, give some presentations and then we're going we're to question him after the, after, the, after the presentation, which would be great. Um, so... We have a uh, we have a, as I said we have a good calendar um, uh, booked in. So, but if anybody's got any suggestions for any kind of topics they'd like to hear about in 2024, you can drop me an email and uh, and we'll investigate whether we can do that too. Um, it was, it's always worthwhile getting getting your ideas on 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 the sessions that we want to cover. Um, I'm sure that I've got a few tucked up my sleeve, but they'll they'll get um, posted and and um, promoted going forward. Uh, so, without further ado, uh, we'll, we'll start. So, our speaker this month uh, is um, uh, Roly Megor, who is a clinical lecturer from um, Edinburgh and West Lothian University. He's also a consultant, um, an honorary consultant ophthalmologist, um, and he's um, undergoing looking at some uh, funding. Well, we're funding him jointly with Retina UK um, with some research around the RPRG gene. I hope I got that correct, Roly. RPGR, yeah, almost, yeah, almost, almost. <laughs> it's it's terrible, you know. But you my got memory's... my name right, so yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. My uh, yeah, my my memory's not that good, sadly. Uh, anyway, well, great. Well, look, it's it's very very. Thank you for coming along, uh, and we'll uh, I'll let you introduce yourself a bit better, and um, we'll hand it over to you, and then we'll we'll ask some questions at the end. So thanks very much. Thanks very much, Colin. I will just share my screen. So can you see that? That looks good. Excellent. I'll just hide that. Okay, brilliant. Right. Well, look, thank you very much for having me. Um, as Colin says, my name is Rudy McGaw. Um, and yes, I'm a clinical lecturer up at the MRC Human Genetics Unit at the University of Edinburgh and a consultant ophthalmologist uh, in NHS Lothian. And my clinical and research interests lie in inherited retinal dystrophies which I'll speak about today uh, and I will also speak a little bit about the project that uh, the Macular Society are very kindly funding although it has just begun so we will be more a couple of slides just on, on what we plan to do rather than what we have done um, but mostly today I'll tell you a story about uh, that we've been working on in the lab um, which is focused on trying to understand a very fundamental process of cell biology um, but one which, uh, because I'm an ophthalmologist, I very much come at it from a human disease point of view. Um, and so, so I will talk about that today. So what I'm showing you here is a photo of a euglena, which is a single celled organism, which arose during the Cambrian explosion about 580 million years ago. And back in these days, we were all just floating around in an ectoplasmic soup and we couldn't see anything. And then at some point in time, the euglena developed a mutation and due to selection bias or, or, or survivability, and it started producing a light sensing protein, a light sensing chromophore. And as a result, it could then start to appreciate light and dark and, and the light coming from the world around it. And then it needed to then therefore understand and process all this information and so it built behind this light sensing protein it built a sort of central processing unit which is what we now call the brain and so as ophthalmologists we always like to tell neurologists that the brain is just an extension of the eye but certainly the eye did come before the brain so fast forward 580 million years we've all 
evolved from a single celled organism and we now have two eyes um, with which we, we see. And it's the back of the eye, which is the light sensing neuroretina, which is the site of the initiation of, of our vision. And uh, it is a beautiful structure. It's a very simple structure. It's three layers, the photoreceptor layer, the bipolar layer, and then the ganglion cell layer are all we need to turn uh, electromagnetic radiation from all around us into a visual impulse and allow us to, to, to navigate and, and interact with the world. We've evolved so much in the last few years that we now seem to have, uh, by and large, all of us have a smartphone attached to one of our hands. Um, and this has really become an extension of us, or maybe we are an extension of the smartphone. But whether or not food porn is your thing, we are now probably using our vision more than ever and we rely on our vision more than ever. So understanding vision and understanding the mechanisms that cause loss of vision are extremely important, probably now more so than ever. So the site of the initiation of the visual cascade is the photoreceptor, which is the cell right at the back of the neuroretina. And we have about 100 million of these in each eye. And they are conventionally divided into an inner segment and an outer segment divided by what we call a connecting cilium. But in actual fact, this entire outer segment is a highly modified primary cilia. Now cilia are the sensory organelles that are present on pretty much every single cell in our body and they allow uh, us to interact with, with our environment, okay? So it is, it is the cilia on our cells that allow us to hear. It's the cilia in our cells in our nose that allow us to smell. It's the cilia in our kidney tubules that allow us to, 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 to concentrate our urine. Really, it just they are important in pretty much every single uh, process in our body. And it's the cilia in our photoreceptors that are allowing us to see. And the way that we do that is that cilia have little um, uh, receptors on their cell surface called G protein coupled receptors. And, and that is what allows it to interact with its environment. And it's previously been shown that uh, cilia can get rid of their G protein coupled receptors from their tip by shedding little vesicles, okay? And that's a process called ectocytosis. But photoreceptors are special and they do not do that. What they do is instead of shedding vesicles from their tip to get rid of their G protein couple receptors, they form a massive expanse of ciliary membrane which falls back and forth in itself to form hundreds of disc like processes which are stuffed full of their G protein couple receptor. And that is called rhodopsin. And rhodopsin is a light sensing G protein coupled receptor. And therefore, by concentrating millions of molecules of rhodopsin into the outer segment, it allows us to see. And in this extraordinary feat of biology, this outer segment, these hundreds of discs full of rhodopsin, completely renew every week. And for that to occur, you need to have a massive amount of trafficking of protein into the outer segment of the photoreceptor. And you need, you need to have a massive um, expanse of this ciliary membrane. And there are very, very specific um, mechanisms through which that is controlled. And whenever that goes wrong due to human mutations, patients develop an inherited retinal dystrophy. Now, the inherited retinal dystrophies are the leading cause of visual loss in children and adults of working age in the UK. What I'm showing you on the left here uh, is a photo of a healthy retina. And what I'm showing you on the right is a retina of somebody with a disease called retinitis pigmentosa, which is the most common inherited retinal dystrophy. And retinitis pigmentosa is characterized by a classic clinical triad of uh, a pale optic nerve narrowing of the blood vessels at the back of the eye and the deposition of lots of pigment in the peripheral retina. So whenever we as clinicians look at the back of the eye, we say, ah, that's retinitis pigmentosa. But it's a bit of an archaic term. It's a bit of an umbrella term because we now know that there are over 280 genes, mutations in which can cause retinitis pigmentosa or the other inherited retinal dystrophies. So really this broad term and together is the leading cause of visual loss, but really we have, you know, 280 diseases because different genes which do different things in the light sensing photoreceptors um, uh, are mutated to cause the disease. And the gene that we're interested in, or one of the genes we're interested in, and which I'll speak about today, as Colin says, is the RPGR gene. So mutations in RPGR 
cause 90% of X-linked retinitis pigmentosa. That's the type of disease that is passed from mother to son. And um, uh, and so, like I say, it causes the vast majority of, of X-linked retinitis pigmentosa. And the RPGR gene is a bit of a strange gene because it's what we call alternatively spliced. So in all cells in your body, you make RPGR and you make a, an RPGR, which a, a protein, which I'm showing here at the top. But in the photoreceptor, the photoreceptor has evolved to um, splice its RNA slightly differently so that it makes a slightly longer protein which is specific to the photoreceptor. And it's this protein which is particularly important for photoreceptor function. And because of that, the mutations that cause RP are mostly in this photoreceptor specific form of RPGR. Now, <clears throat> Like I say, RPGR is the leading cause of uh, retinitis pigmentosa, but it is a bit of a strange one because depending on where the mutation is along the gene, it can cause different types of retinal disease. So most of them cause retinitis pigmentosa, but some of uh, the mutations can cause a cone rod dystrophy. Now you have two types of photoreceptors. You've got rod cells, which can detect black and white, and movement um, and meet, um, whenever the rods don't function properly you get retinitis pigmentosa but you also have cones and cones are the light sensing photoreceptors which mostly make up your macula and uh, they are responsible for your color vision and your fine vision so whenever you have a problem with your cones you very often develop a macular dystrophy and so different mutations in RPGR can either cause RP retinitis pigmentosa or they can cause a cone dystrophy or a macular dystrophy so it's a very strange gene in that you know depending on where your mutation is you can get almost different um, forms of, of retinal disease but ultimately in time all photoreceptors degenerate and patients develop total blindness now regarding genetic eye disease inherited retinal dystrophies um, the vast majority of or the, the, the main hope for IRDs recently has been in the form of, of gene therapy and we now have a licensed product a licensed gene therapy that we can give to our patients on the NHS if they have a mutation in the specific gene and that gene is called RPE65 um, and the studies have shown that if we deliver um, if you package this gene into a virus and deliver it to the under the retina and um, this uh, virus can infect uh, your light sensing cells it can start making the the normal RP65 protein and you can rescue vision um, and that's fantastic but um, the RP65 gene causes a very rare form of our of retinal dystrophy and so what people are labs and uh, companies around the world are now doing are trying to run clinical trials to uh, see whether gene therapy works for other genes and they're really having to go with this one gene at a time and um, I'm showing you in the top right if you can see it a video of how a gene therapy is given so you put ports into the eye and what I'm showing you here is a video where a little needle is going through a hole in the retina and, uh, and then you can inject uh, a solution containing the gene therapy which causes a big bleb that causes a little detachment of the retina um, and the gene therapy is contained in that liquid and it can then infect your light setting cells and hopefully recover vision. And as I say, companies realize that gene therapy works for eye disease it's very very exciting and so we are currently in edinburgh taking part in a worldwide gene therapy trial for rpgr disease for this gene i'm talking about um, and we are hopeful that uh, you know in a couple of years time we'll be able to say that um, the patients that have been treated with this particular gene therapy the rpgr patients have recovered sight but um it's somewhat of a cautionary tale because um the RP65 patients who have been receiving the gene therapy, although they have had improved vision initially, over uh, f uh, four years, the, st the studies have shown that perhaps the, the um, effect is lost in these patients. And one of the things that we are now discovering is that gene therapy can cause a bit of inflammation at the back of the eye. 
I'm showing you, if you can see, four photos here um, of a patient with RP65 disease. Um, in the top left, there's a photo of his eye, his or her eye before they have the therapy. In the bottom left image is, um, in, during the operation, is the, the bleb after the gene therapy has been given under the retina and has caused a little localised attachment. And then in the top right, I'm showing you an image of the eye some months after the therapy. And what has happened is there's been a lot of atrophy, there's been a lot of degeneration of the retina at the site that the gene therapy was given. And this is because we think this gene therapy product, because it is packaged in a virus, is causing a very low grade inflammation and is causing accelerated degeneration of the eye, of the retina. So it's a bit of a cautionary tale. And we in our lab therefore believe that um, it is reasonable to search for other potential therapies for, for these retinal degenerations. One thing that we have done previously in the lab is use stem cells to model retinitis pigmentosa and I'd like to talk about that now. So stem cells have a bit of a rich history in Edinburgh and um, on the left here I'm showing you a photo of Professor Serene Wilmot uh, kneeling beside Dolly the sheep. Um, now Dolly the sheep was born when Ian Wilmot took one of uh, her mum's or took some of her mum's uh, breast tissue, took some of the cells and took the DNA out of her uh, of the the breast tissue cells and put it inside uh, took one of her mum's eggs hollowed out the dna from her eggs and put the dna from the breast tissue into the egg they then implanted that into dolly's mum's uh, womb and dolly the sheep was born and what it showed was definitively that mammals and we are mammals humans are mammals you could take a stem cell and a stem cell is a cell which kind of can self-renew, can keep regenerating, and can also then divide into any cell in the body. You could take a stem cell, and uh, sorry, you could take an adult uh, a cell, in this case breast tissue, turn it into a stem cell, and from that you could grow a, a full mammal. Um, and it, sh it showed that it could be done, and if it could be done in a sheep, it could probably be done in a human. So uh, fast forward to 10, 15 years, uh, Shinya Yamanaka proved that this could be done in humans as well. You could take skin biopsies from humans and turn them into stem cells. Um, and by doing so, you could then, in theory, from that stem cell grow any cell in the body. And so what we have done previously is we have taken skin biopsies from patients with RPGR mutations who have gone blind. We've made stem cells and then we've used um, a technique that um, a Japanese uh, scientist called Yoshiki Sasai uh, developed and I'm showing you a video of this in the middle and what he showed is that if you take a stem cell if you give it a certain sort of cocktail and recipe of chemicals and you pattern it towards a, a front brain fate these cells have the ability to self-organize and form little mini eye cups in a dish so it was previously thought that you needed you know you know, in, an, in utero when you're developing, you needed, you know, countless different chemicals and, and, and uh, factors from your mum to, to tell you how to form eyes, but really you just need a couple and these cells can self-organise and do it themselves. And so I was able to take um, stem cells made from patients with RPGR mutations and grow little mini eyes in a dish. And whenever you do so, you see over 30 or 40 days, you get these little embryoid bodies forming and you get little outpouchings of retinal tissue, which forms back in itself and folds in. And when you mature it, it gets a pigmented pigment epithelial layer underneath and you then have a nice um, a mini eye in a dish. And with that, you can then therefore, um, you've got this disease in a dish, you've got little eyes you've grown which have RPGR mutations, and you can then take uh, skin biopsies from these patients' relatives who don't carry the RPGR mutation, and you can grow healthy eyes in a dish, and you can then examine uh, the difference between the RPGR mutant mini eyes and the healthy mini, uh, mini eyes, and see, look for any differences. And whenever we did that, what we saw was that the patients, the RPGR mutant mini eyes, had too much actin in their cells. Now, actin is the skeleton within all of our cells. And uh, actin um, 
grows lengthwise as more molecules are added to form this huge skeleton within your cells and what that does is it allows your cell to move and to change shape um, and um, this was interesting that uh, patients with RPGR mutations had too much actin in their photoreceptors. Now why that's interesting because I spoke earlier about how um, our photoreceptors outer segment is completely renewed every week and this requires a lot of membrane deformation uh, you know changes in the cilia membrane shape to allow these new discs this new outer segment to be formed <clears throat> and it has been thought for 30 or 40 years that the way that the outer segment forms in the in the photoreceptor is due to actin it was previously shown, and I'm showing you on the left here, a very old electron micrograph photograph, which shows that there is actin present at the site where these discs are forming. Ten years later, it was shown that if you removed actin from the photoreceptor, you got a massive overgrowth of the, um, of the photoreceptor discs. So the discs um, couldn't form, the, the photoreceptor couldn't form new discs, and so you got massive lengthening of the existing discs. So it's been thought for about 30 years that actin, this skeleton within the cell, is important for photoreceptor outer segment formation. And here I was saying in our stem cell derives RPGR mutant photoreceptors, we had too much actin. So to further explore this, I went over to Houston, where a man called uh, Theodore Wenzel has pioneered the use of cryo-electron tomography, which is this amazing technique where you can um, image uh, photoreceptors at a previously unheard of level of, ma of magnification. And what we were able to sh see is, and I'm showing you a little video here of one of the tomograms, is that we saw fibers, ex uh, actin fibers extending from the photoreceptor into the outer segment. So it looked like these outer segment discs were forming by actin. So to test whether RPGR was regulating actin in the process of disformation. <clears throat> we developed uh, two humanized models of RPGR uh, retinitis pigmentosa. So we caused little mutations in RPGR in mice, which, compl which perfectly mimicked the mutations which uh, patients have whenever they develop retinitis pigmentosa or a cone macular dystrophy. And what we are able to do uh, at the human genetics unit where I work is we've got a full phenotyping suite for these mice where we have all the machines that we also have in our hospital but just uh, custom for mice so we're able to do um, what we call electrodiagnostic testing where we, we can assess the mice vision and what we saw was that these RPGR mice develop visual loss we also have OCTs. If you ever go to a hospital, um, for those with macular disease or whether you go to an optician, you will no doubt have had um, an image of the back of your eye taken with uh, an OCT machine. We have an OCT machine that's been adapted for mice and what we saw was whenever we made this RPG mutation, the, uh, the f uh, mice lost their photoreceptors. They underwent photoreceptor degeneration. And we also used uh, autofluorescence, which again is a common uh, photograph that we take in the hospital to assess the health of your retina and your macula and we saw that the the RPGR mutant uh, diseased mice had an unhealthy retina. So we'd made a model of RPGR with a mouse and it seemed to mimic what happens in human disease. Whenever we looked at the photoreceptors, specifically at the back of the eye using electron microscopy, which is a, again a very um, high powered uh, microscope, what we saw was that the outer segments were abnormal. So the outer segments were very short um, and um, they, instead of making discs, they seemed to be uh, shedding lots of vesicles. They seem to be getting rid of a lot of their membrane. So clearly these retinas are very sick due to the RPGR mutations. Now, because the outer segments were shorter, we wondered, was this because there was um, too much actin, just like we saw in our human stem cells, um, and therefore um, the uh, mice weren't able to make uh, these outer segment discs quick enough. They weren't able to, to renew their outer segments. And this will be in keeping with what we see in our patients. On the left here, I'm showing you an OCT of um, a healthy patient. Uh, a person with a healthy retina um, and with an OCT you can see the photoreceptor layer at the back of the eye 
Now, whenever uh, patients have an RPGR mutation, uh, I'm showing you a photo on, on the right of an OCT of, of an RPGR patient, they lose their outer segments and you can see that on the OCT. So this would be in keeping with the fact that maybe these RPGR patients aren't able to, um, to, to make uh, their outer segment, to renew their outer segment quickly enough. So to test whether this was the case, what we did was <clears throat> we added a little tag onto uh, the rhodopsin molecules in these mice. Now I spoke about these G protein coupled receptors that allow our cilia to signal and rhodopsin is one of the key G protein coupled receptors in our photoreceptor cells that allow us to see that that's the pigment that responds, that detects light. And we tagged this rhodopsin molecule with what we call a snap tag. Now this allowed us to inject um, a, a label, a coloured label into the mouse eye, which labelled all of the um, rhodopsin in the eye um, one colour, so we could label it green. And therefore when you do that, you can then image the entire outer segment because it's fluorescing green. Whenever you then wait four days, and uh, inject a different coloured dye, the new rhodopsin molecules that have been made and therefore the new outer segment discs that have been made will be labelled that different colour so they'll be red. So therefore <clears throat> doing this experiment allows you to measure how quickly the uh, mice can make new outer segments. And whenever we did that with our, our PGR mutant mice, we wondered would they be making less outer segment discs? And that's exactly what we see. So on the right here, I'm showing you two photos. The top one is the um, the new disc that have been made in a healthy wild type mouse. And in the bottom is uh, the new discs that have been made in the RPGR mutant mice. And they are, they, less discs have been made. So it looks like uh, the RPGR mutant mouse has this shortened outer segment because it's not making the discs quickly enough. So of course I've seen in the uh, human stem cell model that there was too much actin in the photoreceptors and the question was is that the same in the mouse? So what I'm showing you in the top image here and um, in labelled in blue is actin in the photoreceptor and whenever we looked at the RPGR mice which you can see in the bottom uh, picture and um, uh, what we saw was at the level of the cilia, the level of the outer segment, there was far too much actin in this, uh, in this RPGR mutant mouse. So the RPGR mutant mouse is losing its sight just like the human. Um, it's not making enough outer segment um, and there seems to be too much actin at the site where this outer segment is, is, um, is, is, is being made just like we see in our human models. We then um, brought our mice over to Houston, where, like I say, uh, Ted Wenzel has pioneered the use of this cryo-electron tomography. And with this tool, with this uh, microscope, we were able to look right inside the new discs that are being formed. And what we saw was that there was too much actin within this disc. So we think that maybe this, um, uh, this, this actin is clogging up these new discs that are being formed and they are therefore not able to form properly. We were able to then develop this a live imaging technique where we can uh, label uh, actin in uh, retinal slices and we're able to in real time image what this actin is doing in the photoreceptor. And I'm showing you two videos here if you can see them. On the left is a healthy mouse, on the right is our RPGR mutant mouse. And what we saw was that um, actin is moving quite a lot in the um, uh, in the wild type mice. Now actin is a very dynamic molecule because like I say it makes skeletons and then it takes down the skeletons and we think maybe that this building and disassembly of the actin is what allows these new discs to form and then the, the actin skeleton is taken away to then allow this disc to mature before a new one is built and we saw that with whenever our PGR is mutated there was reduced movement of the actin. So then the question was, well, if RPGR is involved in regulating actin, which, was, which in turn is allowing these discs to form and this outer segment to form, which is allowing us to see, and um, whenever that RPGR is mutated due to human mutations, um, uh, 
causing far too much actin to be present where discs are formed. If you can get rid of that actin, is there a possibility that you could um, rescue the, 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 the visual loss? So what we did was um, we uh, treated these mice with a drug which gets rid of actin. So I'm showing you two photographs at the minute here. On the left is a healthy outer segment. This is an electron microscopic image of a, of a healthy uh, outer segment. And with it, within the healthy outer segment, hundreds of discs are nicely stacked one on top of the other. In the middle image, um, I'm showing you the RPGR mutant mouse, where you have the the split discs and the shortened outer segments and if you remember i mentioned that all these vesicles were being shed from the base of the outer segment and what we wondered was are these vesicles being shed because uh, the mouse is trying to form discs but can't and so it just starts getting rid of the membrane by shedding them as vesicles and whenever we treated the mice with an injection of a drug which got, gets rid of the actin what we saw was that the these vesicles disappeared so um, we were able to rescue this vesicle formation uh, in the RPGR mutant mouse. So what we think might be happening is that um, disc formation is indeed, an outer segment formation is indeed an actin driven process, whereby uh, at the, in our photoreceptor we build out this actin skeleton which allows the membrane to change shape and these discs to form. And whenever uh, the disc is fully formed, uh, different molecules move in to take away the scaffold of actin which allows the disc to mature and that allows the disc to be fully formed over and over again every week allowing for normal vision and what we think happens whenever RPGR is mutated is that um, whilst the actin can form leading to the disc uh, being bulged out the because of the RPG R mutation, you can't then disassemble this actin scaffold, and as a result, there's too much actin where discs are forming, and as a result, the discs don't form properly, and instead they're shed as vesicles, and this leads to a reduction in the amount of outer segment being made, and therefore a reduced ability for us to see, and eventually, because of this stress of the cell, because of all these vesicles being formed, the photoreceptors photoreceptors degenerate, and we lose our sight. So we are now exploring different drugs to try to uh, regulate this um, this actin turnover in our RPGR mutant mice, and the hope is that we will, uh, um, you know, nail on the, the the mechanisms through which this is done, and uh, and the hope is that we can then start to develop drugs to try to treat this to try to prevent the sight loss. So that's all I'm going to talk about, about what we've been doing in the lab. Um, what I would also now just like to talk very briefly on is the project that the Macular Society are very kindly sponsoring. Um, as I said, um, different RPG mar RPGR mutations can cause different disease. And a subset of patients who get a mutation at the end of the RPGR gene develop a macular disease. So they get a macular dystrophy. And I'm showing you here a photograph um, of um, the back of someone's eye with RPGR uh, macular dystrophy. And the macula uh, is, is the cells in the macula, the cone photoreceptors are lost and this patient is blind. And so we're trying to understand what we want to do in this project is try to understand <clears throat> what the RPGR's role is in the cone photoreceptors and um, to see whether we can better understand it to obviously eventually to try to develop therapies for RPGR macular dystrophy. Um, I said to you earlier we made these mouse models of RPGR so we have two different mutations. One is a mutation that causes predominantly a rod uh, dysfunction, so a, a retinized pigmentosa-like disease and sight loss and loss of photoreceptors. And the other one develops um, uh, firstly a cone dystrophy, so they lose their cone function before they, before they eventually lose uh, total visual loss and undergo uh, photoreceptor death. So we are going to use this cone model of disease to try to uh, better understand um, what RPGR's role is in the cones and to try to understand why these patients are getting a macular dystrophy and losing their central vision so early in life. 
And the way we're going to do that is we have um, a reporter mouse, um, which is a cone reporter mouse. And I'm showing you here on the right hand side an image of this cone reporter mouse, which Chloe uh, Brotherton, uh, the PhD student that the Macular Society are funding, has taken. And this cone uh, reporter mouse has a fluorescent green protein knocked in to uh, one of the genes which is critical for cone function and so what you can hopefully see here is there's lots of labeling of cones in green and therefore what, what i mean by that is every single cone in this mouse is fluorescently green and what we're able to do because of that is we are able to do something called cell sorting, where we can use this fluorescent, um, the fact that these cones are fluorescent green, we can use that to isolate all the cones from um, from the macula at the back, or from, from the retina at the back of this mouse eye. So we are crossing this mouse with the RPGR mutant mouse, so that these mice will not only have their threat cones fluorescent green, but they'll also be carrying the RPGR mutation, and we're going to um, pull out the, the cones by using this green fluorescence, and we're going to analyze the RNA um, a, in these cells, something called RNA sequencing, which allows us to examine the uh, activity of every single gene uh, in those cones and see if we can identify differences between the RPGR mutant and the wild type cones. And hopefully with that, <clears throat> we can start to build pathways or a better understanding of the pathways that are disrupted in the cones and what, what is causing this macular dystrophy. Another thing that Chloe is going to do is Chloe is um, going to go over to the Netherlands um, because a, a scientist over there called Ronald Roopman alongside Paul Guichard have pioneered the use of a technique called ultra expansion microscopy to look at photoreceptors in unbelievably high detail and focused detail and magnified detail and so Chloe funded by the Macular Society is going to go over to the Netherlands to learn how uh, Ronald and Paul have, have, have are, are using this technique and with that we're hoping to um, we're, we're hoping to use it to try to better understand what RPGR's role is uh, in, in cone function. So that's all I'm going to say. Um, hopefully um, I haven't completely bamboozled you with science and hopefully I have convinced you that um, we think we've understanding now what RPGR's role is in the light sensing photoreceptor at the back of the eye. We think it involves in regulating this turnover of this, skeleton, this actin skeleton within the photoreceptors, which is allowing our photoreceptors to completely turn over this outer segment every week, which is crucial for us to see. And whenever you get mutation in RPGR you lose that ability and that causes cell death and, uh, and, and sight loss and hopefully this is a stepping stone to start to try to identify potential therapies. So I would just like to finish by thanking um, everyone in my lab, Chloe, Faye and Linda, who've uh, done a lot of this work. Um, I'd also like to thank everyone in Pleasantine Mills Lab, who I work very much alongside and under. Um, I'd like to thank Ted Wenzel over in Houston, uh, who um, helped us with the cryoelectron tomography work. Um, Vadim Orshavsky at Duke University in the States, who has helped me very helpful, and Laura Macheski at the Cancer Research Institute in Glasgow, who is an acting specialist. Um, of course, I'd like to thank all my funders, um, including the Macular Society and Retina UK, who are funding Chloe and her PhD. Um, and of course, I'd like to thank all my patients in NHS Lothian, um, who are all very heavily involved in my research, not least the people that gave their pound of flesh, who gave their skin biopsies so that we could do all, all our stem cell work. So with that, I will stop talking and I would happily take any questions if anybody has them. Marvellous. Well, that was really interesting. Thank you ever so much, Roly. Um, it's it's very, very interesting to learn, um, you know, from after time, really, how what our eyes work and, and how they stop working. It's, it's very interesting. I think that's the first time anyone's actually covered that on one of our sessions, so that's really cool. So thanks very much. Um, Sarah, um, have you got any questions? Yes, no, it was, it was really interesting. And I, I don't think I really understood how important RPGR was. Um, so is, is RPGR one of the most common IRD mutations? So, yeah, so as I said earlier, you know, we now know that over 280 genes 
you know, mutations and over 200 genes can cause IRD. So really, this is a massive um, uh, spectrum of diseases. Um, and RPGR is one of the most common. Um, so it's probably the fourth, yeah, the fourth most common uh, gene worldwide mutations in which can cause uh, retinitis pigmentosa. There are others which are slightly more common which can cause macular dystrophies. Uh, I'm sure you've heard of Stargardt's disease, um, but but as far as the retinal dystrophies go, yeah, RPGR is pretty common. And it also causes quite a severe disease. So uh, patients um, tend to, if they have the RP disease uh, caused by RPGR, they tend to get quite severe night blindness, uh, you know, well before the age of 10 and by the time they reach their teens they've really got quite constricted visual fields and they start to lose their central vision by their late teens so it's a pretty um a pretty aggressive disease pretty common disease as far as retinal dystrophies go um and like i say we you know we don't have any treatment for them although we're very hopeful this gene therapy trial will will, will show improvement in uh, um in the patients um, yes and about that gene therapy trial um, is that able to, is that specific to one mutation or is it able to have used for other RPG? Mutations? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. So, so luck, luckily, um, uh, it, it is for, well, it is for any mutation which causes retinitis pigmentosa. So the problem with gene therapy is, um, you don't want the when a gene therapy is essentially as a human gene packaged into a, a virus and you don't want that uh, gene necessarily switched on in every single cell in the body and so to stop that what you do is you uh, you put a promoter in front of the human gene which is specific to your cell of interest so in our case for for the photoreceptors, we'll put a photoreceptor specific promoter. And what that means is that if it gets into the correct cell, it'll turn on and start making the gene. But if it gets into the bloodstream and goes to the liver, it won't start making it in the liver because there's no, there's nothing to activate that promoter, if that makes sense. However, um, in the retina, as I said, you've got two types of light sensing cells. You've got your rod cells and you've got your cone cells. And the promoter that this company are using is a rod specific promoter. <clears throat> so it's only going to turn on if it works properly. It's only going to make the human RPGR gene in the rods and therefore it won't make it in the cones. And therefore, if you have a macular dystrophy caused by a cone death, due to this, uh, due to an RPGR mutation, it, it shouldn't help with that. And therefore this gene therapy trial is only for patients with retinitis pigmentosa rather than the macular dystrophy. Okay, thank you. Um, and, uh, but, but yes, but it, it, but, it, but it treats any mutation as long as it causes the retinitis pigment, uh, you know, as long as it causes the retinitis pigmentosa uh, disease. Mm. Would there be the possibility of adding a cone specific ratio for it in the future yes yeah, so, so that's what they'll need to do so if they show it works and um, it's great and it works for rpgr and it means that uh, the rpgr gene can be packaged and can be turned on etc what they will then need to do is switch switch the promoter and make a cone specific promoter and um, which would turn on in cones um, and that will would require a lot of work and um, you know this gene therapy trial has been years in the making but you know it it, it in theory it, it could be done but yes it is a it is a one of the issues with gene therapy in the eyes you've rods and you have cones and um if you you know, a lot of them, you know, will only target one cell type. Is that an ongoing treatment? Um, so you have the, 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 the application of gene therapy. Do you then have to have it again and then again to keep, keep it working? So whenever these uh, gene therapies were first designed, they, they were hoped that they would be once in a lifetime treatments. And the one that we have available on the NHS for the RP65 mediated disease um, for, for the retinal dystrophy, you get that once in each eye. And that's what the NHS fund, I mean, and it costs, you know, I think it's 600,000 pounds per eye. So, you know, it really is expensive stuff, but it was hoped that it would be a one-off, it would work and it would, the, the virus would continue to make this gene forever and ever. But the problem is, 
viruses are foreign and eventually it is possible that your our body will recognize the virus as foreign and will silence the gene um and um if that was to be the case then the the effect of it would would fall off um and time will tell whether that turns out to be the case with these and and it, we might find that in the future it has to be a repeated injection but but we don't know for now right now it, it, they are thought to be you know a once in a lifetime treatment great thanks so any other questions um I know the, the, the project that we're funding is very early, but do you, are you expecting that actin will also play a role in, cone, in the cone? So it, it, it's, re, it's really weird. So um, patients can get such distinct diseases. So, you know, the, the, the macular dystrophy, you know, you have this punched out macula with total loss of cones and they, you know, their night vision is okay. Um, it eventually does degenerate, but it, it, it is so strange that there clearly is a fundamental difference between what RPGR does in rods and cones, that one mutation can cause this and another mutation can cause that. Um, so, I mean, I, my, my bet is still that it's regulating uh, actin, but, but it's, um, my, my guess is that its, it's role is different in rods and cones, oh, sorry, it's, it's necessity um, is, is different in rods and cones. It's doing the same thing, but perhaps it's, it's needed more in the cones early on. And whenever you lose, whenever you have a specific mutation, um, the, the, the cones give up. I, I, just, I just don't know, but hopefully this, this RNA sequencing experiment will, will tell us because it will give us a lot of information just on the cones. Um, and that might, we might be able to pick it apart with that. Brilliant. Okay. Riley, really, thank you for your, your time today. That has been a really interesting talk. And I know lots of people will have questions and, and, and going forward when, once once they've seen it. So uh, really, thank you for coming. I hope the research goes uh, goes well. And please, please, uh, at the end of the project, if you'd like to come back and tell us how it went, that would be that would be really excellent. Uh, and, perhaps, and perhaps Chloe could come along too and talk about how, how, how she's got on as well so that would be great yeah that would be great i'm sure i'd be delighted and i'm sure she would as well fabulous fabulous uh right well in that case i think we'll we'll draw this to a close uh i'd like to thank uh, sarah for coming along as well thanks for coming along and helping out sarah um this uh will be up uploaded onto youtube um pretty soon uh, so people can watch it and watch to the hearts of content and i'm sure loads of questions will happen um, we have a back data catalogue on YouTube as well and, and through the website of all the other uh, sessions we've done previous to this. Um, and my colleague Abby uh, is also turning some of these sessions into podcasts as well. So you get to get to um, enjoy these however you like and wherever you like. So uh, our podcasts are available from all good podcast platforms. Um, anyway, so just at least we say thank Roly again and Sarah again and say uh, catch you next time. Thanks very much.